and find out what's going on up above your head all in the same place. So um, join us live every second and fourth Tuesday of the month at 6 p.m. Mountain Time on YouTube, Twitch, and on Facebook. In this week's show, we are going to have um, Dr. Grant David Meadors, uh, a staff scientist at Los Alamos National Laboratory, Space Remote Sensing and Data Science Group. Uh, his background in LIGO gravitational wave data analysis led to statistical solar wind forecasting with NASA, uh, mapping the outer heliosphere, as well as a new project to detect white dwarf binaries efficiently with the upcoming LISA space-based gravitational wave observatory. And we will hear all about that later on this evening. But before that happens, let's welcome our co-stars. First, astronomer and data visualization engineer at the Adler Planetarium, it's Dr. Lauren Corleys. Hi, everyone. Hey, Lauren. Thanks for joining us tonight. Next, aerospace doctor and founder of Orbital Biodesign, it's Dr. Danny Carroll. And you're muted, Danny. Oh, no, you're not. Hey, <laughs> good to be here. Uh, good to have you back. Uh, next, author, journalist, and creator of the Space Tourism Guide, it's Valerie Steinmeck. Hi, thanks for having me. Good to have you. And last, but certainly not least, back from a much too long hiatus, from the Astro Show and host of her own YouTube show, Nora's Guide to the Galaxy, it's Dr. Nora Bailey. Hi, everyone. Happy to be here again. Hey, Nora. <laughs> it's good to have you back. All right. And now we'll uh, welcome on our co-star, uh, Dr. Grant. Hello, everyone. Thank you welcome. very much. Yeah, thanks so much for joining us. We're excited to have you. And so, yeah. Uh, feel free to uh, join in on all the uh, shenanigans over the next half an hour or so, and then we'll find out more about your research as we uh, get down to the end of the show. All right, so uh, to get started for this evening, we've got astro advice, life advice from astronomers, astronauts, and other scientists. Here is your quotation for this evening, and the co-stars and our special guest will have a few moments to think about who actually said this. The true laboratory is the mind, where behind the illusions we uncover the laws of truth. So uh, the four possibilities for tonight are A, uh, Walter E. Massey, who was an uh, American educator, excuse me, who is, he's 85, he's still alive today, who is an American educator, uh, physicist, and executive, um, the only individual to serve as both president and chairman of the American Association for the Advancement of Sciences, um, also the only person to receive both the Enrico Fermi Award for Science and Technology and the Chicago History Society um, and Public Humanities Award. Um, for humanities. So he has done a lot, was also the director of the National Science Foundation, um, and has always had a strong commitment to achieving uh, racial and social equity in the sciences. So that's option A, Dr. Walter E. Massey. Two, uh, I am going to uh, not pronounce this gentleman's uh, name correctly. I apologize in advance for that. Um, but Sir Jagadish Chandra Bosi uh, was a polymath with interest in biology, physics, botany, and writing science fiction. Uh, the pioneer uh, in the investigation of radio microwave optics uh, and made significant contributions to botany uh, was a major force behind the expansion of experimental science on the Indian subcontinent. He uh, is re regarded as the father of Bengali science fiction uh, he invented the chrysograph, uh, a device for measuring the growth of plants. And he's got a crater on the moon named after him. So uh, quite a laundry list of achievements. That's option B. C, uh, George Washington Carver, who was an American agriculturalist, scientist, and inventor, um, promoted alternative ways um, for cotton uh, crops 
and methods to prevent uh, soil depletion. Um, kind of a leader in promoting environmentalism before that was even a thing. Uh, most prominent uh, black scientist in the early 20th century, received numerous honors uh, for his work, and um, came up with something like 44 uh, ways, excuse me, 105 different ways to use peanuts. Um, we did a lot of research on, um, on peanuts, uh, none of which became commercially sex successful, but um, really, really cool work. And uh, he did all of this uh, after being born into slavery, uh, kidnapped at a week old, uh, and then being raised by the family as their own child who had actually purchased his mother and father um, as slaves, um, who we never got to meet. So amazing, amazing achievements and um, kind of a dark childhood. Um, but that is option C, George Washington Carver. Last but not least, Sir C. V. Raman, an Indian physicist known for his work in the field of light scattering. Um, using a spectrograph, uh, he and his student um, discovered uh, a different way that light scatters. Uh, they called it modified scattering, um, but now it is known as Raman um, scattering. Uh, he received the Nobel Prize in 1930 for that discovery. And uh, there's actually uh, a day in India, um, the National Science Day, which is uh, in commemoration of that discovery, which was on February 28th, 1928. So uh, those are your four options. Walter E. Massey, Sir Jagadish, Chandra Bose, George Washington Carver, and Sir V. C. Raman. What say you, co-stars? I'm not sure, but I'm going to go with C. Okay. One vote for George Washington Carver and Dr. Danny. So it offered this perspective, which is that this is something that clearly comes from a theorist. And I say that with the <laughs> deepest respect for both theorists and experimentalists. Should I offer a vote? Oh, if you wish, if you wish. I'll, I'll go with um, B, Bose. Okay. I was also leaning towards Bose, but I really have no idea. This to me sounds like something a philosopher would say, <laughs> which is great. I love philosophies. <laughs> That's feeling. It feels very poetic to me. So I was like, oh, maybe the science fiction writer, someone who has more of a, a writing background could have said this, but... I'll pick A, because he also won awards for humanities, right? So that's yeah. what I'm going to go yeah. with. Okay, so we got a couple of votes for B, a uh, vote for uh, Walter E. Massey, A. Um, Valerie? Oh, I'll just keep things interesting and I'll vote D. <laughs> All right, we got the whole smorgasbord there. All right, the uh, correct answer was and is B. <laughs> True laboratory is the mind, where behind the illusions we uncover the laws of truth. So, uh, what do y'all think of that? Maybe I'm not using my mind enough every day. I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I agree that it's the the true laboratory. I think both you know the mental laboratory and the actual physical laboratory um, are important in uncovering you know the laws of the universe but i think it's definitely interesting to remember that you know science is just scientists thinking about things that they're at the root of it yeah i mean there, there's some good laboratories out there you know los alamos for instance oh, thank you <laughs> well I'll say this is a very um profound and bold ontological claim about it being the true laboratory. But uh, the thing I like about it is that he's putting forward that there are illusions that we have to sift through and uncover. And maybe we can do that with, you know, some experiments now and then too. <laughs> yeah, I like that. I, I, I'm, I'm curious what he thought of as the illusions, right? Is is that just our, our misunderstanding about things before we understand them in more scientific ways? Or is it 
something like you say a little bit more ontological about how the brain works or um, data processing. I, I, I don't know where he was going with this, but it, it makes me curious. It definitely was, gave me vibes of Descartes, like a lot of cookie to ego assume here. <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe he's saying that things are only meaningful when we understand them in the mind. Hmm. Could be. It reminds me of something that my psychiatrist friends would say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is definitely, uh, um, yeah, along those lines. Yeah. Oh, we just lost Annie. She, she dropped wisdom and then she was just out. That was great. <laughs> Mic drop. <laughs> <laughs> no, I really like this quote. I think uh, I think it is clear that it's it's a writer's mindset in the structure of this phrasing. I mean, it just has words which are particularly evocative that sort of mm. challenge you as you try and make sense of them, which is what makes it a great quote is that it sort of requires us to use our own minds to see which parts like to me just the fact that he uses words like laboratory illusion and laws of truth <laughs> I'm like what does all that mean I just want to dig in and think more about it so it's just a beautifully written quote um do you know the the context in which it was said I don't unfortunately okay. but uh, I'm gonna find out because I <laughs> I really do want to know um, I don't know if it's a piece from one of his um, his writings, like like his science fiction writings, or, or what. I think it's interesting though, because I've been I've always lived my life this way, but I've been trending more in this opposite direction to try and refine this sense, just sort of a wonder, and not having a need to always understand everything. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Um, so I'm like thinking of it just today, I was walking through a field, it's springtime, finally in Chicago, there were all these wildflowers blooming. And so I like took a picture because I just, they made me really happy. They were beautiful and sent them to someone who was immediately like, well, what kind of flower is it? Can we look it up? I'm like, I don't really need to know any of that. It was just really beautiful today. <laughs> and so trying to just be in the moment and appreciating it for what it is, instead of trying to dissect everything always too. So. Yeah. And I, I, I wonder actually if he's coming at this, even though we're all interpreting it, or many of us are interpreting it from a scientific perspective, whether it's met from a more spiritual perspective, whether he's just talking about mm, the illusions of separateness or, or something more along those lines, um, and talking about undercoming fundamental spiritual truth as opposed to scientific truth. Um, I'm not sure. Maybe both. Other thoughts? Okie dokie. Well, uh, let's move on to Astro 365. Today in astrophysics history. Uh, so on this day in 1984, uh, Challenger astronauts George Nelson and James von Hofton completed the first in-space satellite repair of the ailing Solar Max astronomy satellite. I had never heard of the Solar Max astronomy satellite. Um, one of the uh, first X ray satellites that was launched to um, study um, X ray radiation um, from our host star. And apparently, shortly after launch, um, when it was launched in 81, there were some malfunctions. Um, and then this repair um, made history in that it was um, successfully put back into orbit and continued working um, until 1989. And so, yeah, completed its mission and then some, thanks to uh, this repair work done in April of 1984, um, just a couple of years, unfortunately, before the, the Challenger disaster. Um, there were um, a couple of missions between um, this and that. Um, but yeah, this was uh, the first of its kind for um, satellite repair. So um, it is time to get into the news trivia quiz. Uh, Nora, I'm not sure you were here since we changed things up. It's, it's all lightning round now, Nora. And so okay. you, you just shout out the answer as soon as you think you know it. I almost um, forgot about this. I'm like nervous. <laughs> <laughs> It's all fun and games here. It's all, <laughs> it's all fun and games. 
Let me tell uh, you, it gets pretty tough when there's only one co-star and then, you know, <laughs> several PhDs in the room answering these. <laughs> last week or last last show, it was just me, and I was like, "Oh boy, I'm in, I'm in the deep end now." <laughs> you did great, Valerie. Our, our our guest actually won last week, but um, but Valerie held her own. All right, here we go. What color? are the newly discovered Neptunian Trojan asteroids. Red? Not, they are, yeah, not exclusively oh. red, but, but they're more, more red. They are red-ish compared to other asteroids that have been discovered before. Um, probably um, about their um, chemical composition, um, potentially similar to why Pluto turned out to be so red um, when we thought it was probably a more dull gray. Um, but yeah, turns out a lot of these are red, and we lost Danny again. She doesn't <laughs> like red asteroids, <laughs> um, but she'll be back. All right, Nora, nicely done. So we've got one point for Nora. Actually, no, Nora, you've got two points because you guessed the uh, correct uh, quotator. That's right, and that was a total guess too. <laughs> yeah, Nora's, got two. Nora's got two. Grant has one. All right, here we go for the second question. The European Space Agency's Juice mission launches in just two days. What will that mission explore? It's the Jupiter icy moons composition explorer? Yeah, that's it. That's I juice. Do. Yeah, so it's uh, it's going out and studying uh, Europa, Callisto, and Ganymede. Um, very exciting stuff. Uh, it doesn't have a lander. It's just going to be orbiting those icy moons, but should send back some pretty cool information about the um, possibility of liquid water, and who knows, maybe even life somewhere deep below those icy crusts. We will find out in a few years. <laughs> it's just getting launched this week. <laughs> it's gonna be it's a short trip, right? I mean, it's, it's a short trip. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, 500 million miles. No big deal. No big deal. All right, so that ties it up. We got two for Nora and two for Grant. Here we go. Astronomers just discovered an unusual, very thin, almost straight streak of young stars and shock gas. What is this a possible indicator of? Wow. A new galaxy forming? Uh, you're on the right track. Not a, not a galaxy. It's an escapee of a it's galaxy. Is it in the uh, subtitle of this episode? It might be. A runaway black hole. <laughs> a runaway black hole. <laughs> so I don't, I don't know if that was like a shared effort. We should give you both half a point there. <laughs> it is a runaway black hole. Assist. That was a full assist right there. Full <laughs> assist. Um, so yeah, so, we, it, so, so astronomers have predicted that there m might be a possibility that supermassive black holes could actually get ejected um, from their galaxies. Um, I don't understand the mechanism by which that would happen, but this might be the first observational evidence of it actually happening. Uh, a streak of stars kind of like left behind the supermassive black hole exiting its host galaxy. Um, yeah, I don't know how that works. If it's any of you have any it. insights, uh, you can you can fill in the gaps. But yeah, this this might be the first evidence of something like that, um, or not. Um, we we don't really know. Um, all right, so we given that point to Nora, or is that point going to Grant, or both of them? Oh, whatever. <laughs> all right, we're going to give you both. We're going to have points. So you're both a two and a half. Here we go. Uh, NASA's IXPE. It's B, uh, just released a never seen before look at which historic nebula? Is this the Crab Nebula? It is nebula? the Crab Nebula. All right. <laughs> done, Valerie. Yeah, Crab Nebula and X-rays. Check that out. Awesome. Isn't that cool? So this is okay. subconsciously why I thought those asteroids were purple. Because <laughs> purple this week. <laughs> Nice, nice. Yeah, um, very, very cool stuff. You've never seen the Crab Nebula like this. Um, so, yeah, nicely done, nicely done. All right, one point for Valerie. Here we go. What 
rare astronomical event takes place on April 20th this year? It's happening right here on too. your gallery. It's a hybrid solar eclipse. It is a hybrid solar eclipse. Ah. Yeah, so these are these are the rarest of the rare solar eclipses. Uh, you get both a total solar eclipse and an annular solar eclipse. And when I was first learning about uh, solar eclipses uh, back in 2017, I came across this. And before I read the explanation of how this happens, I had to like stop and think about it for a minute. I was like, how could you get an annular eclipse and then a total solar eclipse and then an annular eclipse again? Because that's how it happens. It's like a total solar eclipse sandwiched between annular eclipses on each side. I may want to take a stab at why that happens. It's pretty cool. Is the distance to the moon changing significantly during the eclipse? Not, no, it's not a distance to the moon that's changing, although that does obviously happen. Uh, here, here's the hint. Uh, flat earthers would not get the answer to this question. Oh. Oh, 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 yeah, 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 sorry. Yeah, I was like, what, what about Earth? Oh, it's not, the Earth is round. So it's it's a kind of yeah. the changes in the differences as the, from the perspective going around. Perfect <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, so this this happens when the the shadow of the moon is like just the right distance to hit the Earth. So close to that uh, breaking point so that at the beginning of the eclipse, um, the the distance is too large for the Earth's uh, the Moon's shadow to completely cover the solar disk. As the Earth rotates, um, the full shadow uh, eclipses the entire Sun. You get a total eclipse, and then at the end of the eclipse, um, the curvature again causes that distance to increase just ever so slightly. And then again, the Moon's shadow can't cover the full disk, and you go back to an annular eclipse to end the eclipse. Yeah, pretty cool stuff. So. Uh, take that, flat earthers. If you want observational evidence of the curvature of the Earth, it is coming right at you in nine days. I don't uh, think they not, want evidence. <laughs> <laughs> not in the United States, by the way. Uh, I think like East Timor and um, yeah, yeah. Um, and what's interesting is I think on the map there's nowhere on over land where the annular eclipse is visible. It's all oh. over ocean. It's it's all total when it's over land and, and annular when it's over ocean. Yeah, and that's exactly what the flat earthers wanted, right? They're like, see, it doesn't actually happen. <laughs> Nobody saw it. <laughs> uh, no, this one's real. Okay, um, so Valerie, that was, uh, that was good. So that's two points for Valerie. Nice job. Just trailing by a half a point now. Okay, uh, Northrop Grumman named their new cargo craft for which fallen Columbia astronaut? Mm. Kalpana Chawla? Uh, good guess. It was not. She unfortunately also um, was killed in that disaster. <clears throat> it was Laurel Clark. Mm. Yeah, so she does... Um, get commemorated in the name of this cargo craft. I did not know that. All right, moving on. Astronomers keep finding more and more what around low mass M dwarf stars? Sure seems like they keep finding more planets. Uh, what specific type of planet for full credit? Hot Jupiters? Hot Jupiters, yeah. Oh. It's these like gigantic, uh, gas giant planets that by all planetary theory we have should not be forming around small um, M dwarf stars, but they keep showing up. So it seems like we don't know everything about planetary formation quite yet. All right, so that's three and a half points for Grant. He is pulling out with the lead. We got a few more questions though. Uh, what might be buried in the glow of the brightest gamma ray burst on record. This is interesting. It's not, it's not a black hole. I'll give you that. 
not oh. a black hole, but it might have become one. Oh gosh, I wish I had my GRB friends to ask for help right now. <laughs> Call a friend. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we, should, uh, we, should, we should do kind of like like hotlines, 50-50. Yeah, um, come <laughs> for me, folks. Are you there? <laughs> What do you mean by buried in the glow? I don't even quite understand. I was, yeah, that was a journalistic term that I borrowed from an article. That should be in quotations because I totally stole that. Like, like, is it a signal that that we can tease out of the signal, or is are you exactly. a physical no, object it, that's like? No, no, no. Okay. Yes, <laughs> I, this is metaphor. This is okay. metaphor. This, this um, is I don't fun. know, like some sort of like dark matter signal. I don't know. Less exotic. Yeah, less exotic. It's, but, it's a plain old supernova. Oh, yeah, th so these researchers think that um, this gamma ray burst might have been caused by a supernova um, that then collapsed into a black hole. And so that's um, what okay. their research is focusing on, but um, not decided yet. Um, but there's a, a possibility. Okay, we um, just have three more questions. Uh, excuse me, four more questions to go. So anybody can still win. Here we go. <clears throat> a recently discovered asteroid is actually a what of Earth? Fragment. Not a fragment. Just kidding. Okay. Moon? I mean, who knows? My moon? Not just a moon, a specific type of moon. Oh, gosh. <laughs> I didn't even know this was a thing. Um, oh, no. If you don't know what it was. <laughs> I've never heard of this before, like, two hours ago when I read the article. Oh, man. Uh, this is like a whole other category of moons that I was unaware of. Are there any other moons like this in the solar system? There are. Yeah. There are. Several, in fact. Yeah. This is news to me. They're called quasi-moons or quasi-satellites. Uh, they're asteroids that have an orbit around the sun that also orbit Earth in really, really bizarre ways. Um, but they're, they're not like always orbiting the Earth. They do it for a few decades or a hundred years. This most recently discovered one will do it for several millennia. Um, and um, yeah, it's, uh, it's one of these quasi moons that we never know we had. That's the deal. A quasi moon. How big is it? Uh, tiny. We're we're talking like ten to twenty meters. <laughs> it's a little guy. But yeah, it's a uh, it has lots of friends. Apparently, this is not the first quasi moon that's been discovered. There have been several. All right, a few more questions. Danny, these, this next one here is for you. So. <laughs> no pressure. No pressure. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, here we go. Last week, NASA announced the names of the astronauts for Artemis Two. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> you guys knew that too. And I was, I was so excited. I, like, I know one of these guys. I, name them all. <laughs> I know one of these guys. So, so Reed Weissman is the uh, the uh, gentleman on the right, and he actually came and spoke for a Wyoming stargazing event about um, five years ago. Yeah, he's a, he's a friend of one of our board members' husbands who was actually in the astronaut corps. Um, he didn't make it, but Reed did, and they've remained buddies all these years. And so, yeah, Reed came and um, gave a presentation at Wyoming Stargazing. He was excellent, and um, he's going to the moon, um, which is super cool. Um, so, so these folks aren't going to walk on the moon, um, but they will orbit around the moon and, and come back in very much the same way that the Apollo 13 mission um, came back from the moon. So very cool stuff. Uh, I'm really excited for Reed and the rest of them. And um, yeah, it's uh, getting closer to actually uh, boots on the moon. And um, one of those boots will be a uh, woman's boots, which is pretty exciting. All right, one point for Danny. Nicely done. I knew you had that one, Danny. <laughs> um, you might have this one too. Um, here we go. Uh, speaking of launches, uh, oh, what other spacecraft is scheduled for its first orbital test flight uh, later this month? Starship. Isn't it actually 
Oh, oh, yeah. oh sorry. <laughs> yeah, Nora beat you to the punch on that one. She's on. <laughs> sorry. Yeah, uh, no, I was going to guess a big one. <laughs> that's okay. Cool. Uh, so, yeah, uh, so Starship may actually do an orbital flight test um, later this month. Um, there have been some delays, but it looks like it might actually happen um, before the end of the month, which is pretty cool. So it might actually uh, correspond to the next Astro show. Uh, we shall see. That would be pretty cool. Um, all right, so let's see. Now we're all tied up. It is three and a half points to three and a half points. We have one more question here. Okay, here we go. The Green Monster is the recent nickname given not to the left field wall at Fenway Park. No, no, no. Nothing to do with the Boston Red Sox, but to what? I have not know. Everybody's favorite telescope that we don't call by its appointed name took this right. picture. Uh, Uranus? Nope. Hmm. <clears throat> I'll give you a hint. It's, it's along the lines of um, the stuff we've been talking about in other questions. Oh. Is it some kind of black a hole? Moon? Not a black hole, but maybe the progenitor became a black hole. All right, we're gonna we're gonna leave it as, as a couple. Okay, <laughs> sort of so, nebula. <laughs> it's a supernova remnant, Cassiopeia A, and this big green blob here in the bottom right is the green monster. Oh. Yeah. So now I don't I don't know if the the. Um, astronomers who are analyzing this image were Boston Red Sox fans and they knew what they were doing or they had no idea what they were doing and just used the same terminology but I saw that and couldn't help myself because I, I mean know. I hate baseball and I know the green monster <laughs> <laughs> <Pretty broadly known term. laughs> can I ask where exactly you said bottom right but where oh sorry where yeah exactly I, I don't know if you guys can actually see my mouse moving can you see my mouse or no the big, huge green blob um, in the right-hand corner, that big green mass, that wispy oh. green thing, that is the okay. green monster. And astronomers don't actually know what it is. Um, it wasn't expected to be there. It's um, some type of and it's everything, right? It's like what we do in the show. It's like astronomers didn't think they were going to find this, but they did. <laughs> <laughs> Not to be for you. <laughs> the universe is like, here you go. Figure um, this shit out. <laughs> Are you think you know what you're doing? Let me throw you a bunch of hot Jupiters and crazy yeah. Jupiters. You know what? I think you just coined a term there, Valerie. When astronomers find something they didn't understand before and suddenly discovery, they're going to start calling it hot Jupiters. <laughs> That's, and you you will have said that first right here on the Astro Show. So for all you watching this live, that was the term used by Valerie Steinmeck first on the Astro Show. Anything out of left field. Astronomical, the baseball reference. Astronomical curveballs coming out of left field are called hot Jupiters. There you have it. So yeah, well, they don't know what it is. Um, I think green gas often is like it's like O3, right? Um, so probably probably it's invisible, but this you said was a JWST image. So, oh yeah, it's so, infrared, you're right. So it has yeah. nothing to do with that. Thank you, Lauren. So I don't know what it is. <laughs> That's yeah, I don't either. Um, yeah. I don't think anybody does, but we, we will find out at some point soon. All right. Well, we have a two-way tie for first place with Dr. Nora Bailey and Dr. Grant Metters. Am I pronouncing your last name correctly? Um, oh, yeah. Metters is close enough. Metters. I'm going to take your word for it that's green. I can't really see the difference between the reds and the greens. Are you colorblind? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> Well, uh, my, my apologies for that, but it's in the bottom right, the big, the big, the big blobby thing in the bottom right. <laughs> All right. Well, we are about to uh, hand off the rest of the show to Dr. Grant. But before we do that, a quick diversion to what's up, Dr. Sam. Two cool things to see in the sky this month. Uh, first, tonight, uh, this is the best night you're going to get all year to see Mercury. Tonight is the night. So if you've got clear skies tonight, basically from anywhere in the world, look to the west right after sunset, and you will see a little point of light just above the horizon. 
Um, down below Venus, Venus is going to be the really, really bright one um, looking west. Mercury will be much closer to the horizon, but tonight is a night. Um, this is the best night to see it. It's usually washed out by the glow of the sun um, just after sunset, but tonight um, you, you do have a pretty good shot of seeing it. So check out Mercury tonight if you can. And later this month, you should also check out the uh, Lyrid meteor shower. Um, I think it peaks on the 21st, early morning of the 21st, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, Vega is one of the brightest stars in the sky. Um, you're going to be looking um, towards the east to see uh, this um, meteor shower. Uh, meteor shower, meteor trickle, we're talking like one every four to six minutes. But you get some good fireballs. And interestingly enough, um, every 60 years, you get a really good show um, with the, um, the Lyrid meteor shower. But this is not one of those 60th years. Uh, that doesn't happen for uh, another 20 some years, almost. Uh, 2042 is the next time we'll likely get an outburst um, from this big swath of comet dust left over from Comet Thatcher. Uh, the other cool thing about the Lyrid meteor shower is that it is the oldest known meteor shower. Uh, there's a reference um, from the time of Confucius in ancient China 2,700 years ago um, of them watching this meteor shower. So it, is, um, it has been known for a long, long time. Um, Comet Thatcher has a ridiculously uh, long orbital path. It's like over 100 astronomical units um, away from the sun. So 100 times farther away from the sun than the Earth. So it comes around every 400 some years. Um, so it is ways out there. So you've probably never seen it. Um, if, actually, you've, you've definitely never seen it if you're alive today. <laughs> it, uh, it won't be back until uh, 2283. That's when you have a chance to see it again. So we won't see it either. But anyways, uh, I, definitely... have, I have more fun trivia. Oh, oh this please. is my my birthday meteor shower. My birthday oh, is nice. a meteor shower. Happy, happy, birthday. Well, happy, happy birthday. birthday in about 10 days. <laughs> Thank you. What, what day exactly? That's my favorite thing. The 21st? My birthday is the 23rd. It usually takes the 22nd or 23rd. Cool. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it should. Um, th there should be a few good ones this year. All right. Well, uh, that is it. And um, Grant, um, we are all yours. Um, we would um, love to hear about how you got into astronomy, um, you know, what, what path led you there, cool stuff about what you're studying, all that good stuff. Um, but we'd like to begin with the question that you wish everybody would ask you that nobody ever does. Oh, gosh. I thought that was coming at the end, but thank oh, you yeah, for sorry, asking it. We're having a couple curveballs here on the show. <laughs> That's perfect. Um, well, first, everybody, I'm uh, Grant Metters, pronouns he, him. And I think that I have two answers to that question, if that's okay. So there's one that's pure um, science in the field I'm from. And then there's one that I think ties in really well to the broader scope of doing science as a human being. So um, the pure science one is something like Gosh, could you explain um, what continuous gravitational waves are and when we'll detect them? Uh, and I find that really cool because I worked uh, most intensely of any single area on that question. And it was a really exciting intersection of computing along with um, searches for a type of still undiscovered gravitational phenomena that might tell us a lot if we ever find it about um, general relativity and whether there's more to it. But on the human side, um, I think I wish people asked more frequently, how am I doing? How are you doing? I think it's really easy in science to focus so intently on research, on getting the next grant, the next paper. And it's easy to lose track of how we are faring and feeling and thriving as individuals because um, we're not just individuals we're part of a community 
Nice. I like that. Um, thank you for um, bringing that up. Um, so, um, yeah, thanks for uh, thanks for answering that question in a couple different ways. Um, we would love to hear about those gravitational waves. And so if you want to tell us about those, I think we'll, uh, we're all ears. Oh, sure. And we'd so, love to hear about how you're doing, Grant. <laughs> thanks. Um, so I, these days, I'm starting to dive into new directions in gravitational wave astronomy. But I came here via a very, very long path. And um, I think that uh, I could go in chronological order um, without dwelling too much on the past. But I, I did have a fascination with the stars from an early age. Like a lot of people had a little reflector um, that I used to look up at Andromeda because I thought that's the coolest thing. Something two and a half million light years away. And I was lucky that that was nourished as an interest by um, teachers around me. Uh, not everyone had that. And I was very fortunate um, going through school as I did um, to have that support because I was, um, since it is Autism uh, Acceptance Month, I'll, I'll volunteer. I was diagnosed with it at 11 years old. And um, I really think there was a lot of anxiety amongst um, educators and my parents, like, would I be able to uh, pursue those kinds of passions and interests. Um, and I had a lot of them, not just science. So I've always seen the connection between uh, our studies into the universe and also the um, f nature of humanity. So I really appreciated Bose's quote earlier. I think that um, dealing with that and dealing with a lot of other kinds of challenges in school made it really hard to um, see that I had another thing to deal with later, which is uh, coming out, which I did in college. And um, I was, again, fortunate that people seem to have no issue with a gay astronomer, astrophysicist, um, even in 2006. But it was rare. And that sense of community was um, something that I sought and really strived to find. So it's probably no coincidence that I was drawn towards one of the biggest, most exciting communities that I could find, which was gravitational wave astrophysics. Um, I first read about LIGO uh, a little bit before um, my full undergrad. I went to community college also and then transferred into my undergrad institution. And I read about it in like 2002 when first lock was happening at the observatories. And then in 2005, I did my first internship at LIGO Hanford in Eastern Washington amongst the tumbleweeds. And I thought, this is amazing. They're striving so hard to find something even Einstein thought might never be discovered by human beings, building this incredible four kilometer L in the desert. Um, and as I later saw down in the, um, the wetlands of Louisiana, and I realized this was something I wanted to be a part of. So I gravitated, so to speak, towards LIGO and um, started doing grad school in, in 2008. And then wandered through a lot of different areas from detector characterization, going out of the site, understanding how the instrument worked through quantum squeezing, toying around with Heisenberg's uncertainty principle to um, get from an invisible beam of nothing, a uh, performance equivalent to shooting a more powerful laser through the system was just mind blowing and is now regular practice to detect gravitational waves. And then came back and started working um, in a kind of competition, a friendly one to see who could best detect simulated continuous gravitational waves. And then um, from that, running some big uh, analyses on supercomputers in Germany, um, I did postdoc for three years at the AI Hanover in Germany. I was incredibly fortunate that the first human being to 
notice gravitational waves being reported by the computer via email. So tech being technically correct, Marco Drago was just about three or four drawers down from me um, in that building uh, on September 14th, 2015. It was an amazing experience. And um, then a year in Australia and then coming to Los Alamos. So it's it's been a real adventure. And I'm really excited now for um, the prospects to be revealed by future gravitational wave observatories. We're hoping to see a joint um, European Space Agency, ESA, and NASA launch of um, LISA, the laser interferometer space antenna, in 2037. And it is uh, quite possible that we'll not only see supermassive black hole mergers, but also be able to map out white dwarfs in our galaxy binary systems um, that are emitting continuous gravitational waves, much like I looked for in LIGO, but coming not from neutron stars, but coming from the remnants of systems like our own sun. And that's incredibly powerful. Um, and I've been, again, super lucky to have a lot of supportive people on this journey, including my husband, who's also a staff scientist here at the lab. Well, that is uh, a really cool um, trajectory that you've been on and, um, and story, Grant. Um, I, I don't know that much about um, how much more powerful um, LISA is compared to LIGO. Um, what, what are the, like, the major differences? I mean, I, I realize it's going to be much larger, right, in space, and that makes all the difference in the world. But if you can tell us a bit more about that, I would... Um, I would love to hear about it. Yeah, yeah. We're improving upon the existing generations, both on the ground and in space. LISA is actually, in some ways, a less powerful instrument, but it's what you do with it that matters. So you're right, LISA is vastly bigger. It is um, going to be, in the current configuration, a 2.5 million kilometer triangular shaped uh, satellite constellation. And it has nominally uh, LISA mission duration around four years. It'll trail the Earth in heliocentric orbit, 1 AU, and um, it uses a much fainter laser than uh, certainly advanced LIGO, Virgo, Cagra, um, about of order one watt. And this is then um, measured not with the kind of Michelson interferometry that current ground-based observatories use, but of something known as um, time delay interferometry. So it's a very novel technique, but it's been demonstrated to high technical readiness by the LISA Pathfinder mission from 2015 through 17. And that data is free for the public to analyze. My um, high school students last summer got it off the internet and started um, processing it for correlations with solar wind data and uh, um, it, it was really successful, so people are really um, optimistic about LISA once the spacecraft gets built and then uh, sent into orbit. Very cool. Um, you, you just mentioned your your high school students last summer, so you do some some teaching in the summer. Uh, we are able to have students both at the laboratory as well as um, nearby institutions, and there are several at the. Um, uh, in the overall area. So Santa Fe has um, places like the Institute for Computing and Research, as well as uh, Santa Fe Institute. And um, doing mentoring at both of them has been incredibly rewarding. And I hope that we're able to um, expand into even more fields in the future. Uh, we're already beginning to do research into um, atom interferometers, uh, which may be a complementary or supplementary technique. Ah, the key thing I forgot to mention here is that LISA um, and atom interferometers are providing a completely different perspective on the gravitational wave universe compared to LIGO, um, Virgo, Cagra. Um, as well as to LIGO successors like Cosmic Explorer in the US or Einstein Telescope. So you can imagine that everything we've seen so far is kind of like seeing, um, let's say in the ultraviolet almost of the EM electromagnetic spectrum. Um, the future instruments like LISA are kind of like going to see in the infrared. There's a bit of a gap there that's hard to see with space-based 
a technology as it stands right now, um, and also very hard to see with ground-based technology because there is um, not just seismic motion, but also direct gravitational coupling to mirrors that can only be seen by certain kinds of as yet to be developed technology that's kind of like the optical region. And then down you can kind of imagine like the radio analog our, our colleagues in the pulsar timing array world who use um, instruments and arrays like NanoGrav, the European Pulsar Timing Array, um, the International Pulsar Timing Array, um, and others to try to understand the very biggest black holes of a billion solar masses or more by looking for residual time delays in the pulses of uh, radio observed pulsars, which is just an incredibly cool technique. And they keep tantalizing us with new results that are indicative of something. But so far, I'm not sure if they've detected anything or not. So you, you're just mentioning like time delays in pulsars, right? So we're talking about something that's already pulsing at like several hundred times a second. And so the delays that are being looked for are how long? <laughs> Oh gosh, I wish I could tell you exactly, but they've got the waveforms and they know when something's not arriving on time. Wow, that's um, that's pretty amazing. <clears throat> very, very cool. Yeah. Uh, well, any of the, the co-stars, do you have any um, questions for, for Grant? Feel free to, um, to jump in with anything. I had a question. Um, one of the cool things about gravitational waves is you want to try and look for the optical counterpart, right? So what can we see with more traditional telescopes that maybe cause the gravitational waves? Mm -hmm. But my knowledge is maybe outdated. Back when I was following this more closely, one of the issues was that pinning down where the waves were coming from in the sky, the area was very large. Like a mm -hmm. third of the sky, like or, uh, of the globe could be possible for where it was coming from. So is Lisa more constrained than that to help with these sorts of follow-up observations or is it still just like this huge area that we need to be searching through? It depends on the type of event completely. So um, the sorts of things we've seen with the ground-based observatories thus far have all been mergers, to my knowledge at least. They um, mostly have been black hole mergers, and those have historically not been thought to have any optical counterpart. But it's possible, conceivable, that in certain kinds of environments like um, dust clouds, accretion disks, those sorts of things might almost get smushed in between and then emit some EM. Um, and there are several papers about that topic. Um, and then, of course, there are things like GW170817, the binary neutron star merger. And those did uh, have clear EM counterparts that were detected almost immediately um, across multiple bands. And uh, there are other types of signals not seen yet, continuous ones that would have vastly higher sky localization because they would be observed for a very long time. Mm. The key thing um, when you mention the kind of third of a sky, which, which isn't always true, um, but sometimes can be, is how well you can do with the statistical data analysis. So um, this is the key intersection of math, statistics, simulation, being able to accurately represent gravitational waveforms, as well as observation. And based on that synthesis, you can try to estimate where something is coming from very quickly on your computers, and then tell, tell telescopes where it's productive for them to point. So we're getting better at that, um, better instruments help, as well as better simulation and models and analysis. And um, with that, people are working very hard on reducing that sky area. And the Cosmic Explorer Horizon study, I believe, has some projections of what ground-based telescopes or observatories may be able to do in the future. Lisa. Um, based on the kinds of things that it sees, which are emerging, um, which are largely black holes, supermassive mm -hmm. ones, it's not clear what kinds of EM counterparts those will have, except for the very occasional um, lead up to a LIGO-like event that might give some lead time of order weeks to months for something that may be later seen mm -hmm. in the current bands. Um, and then those would have even better localization than they do today. Yeah. Cool. That's really yeah. neat. <laughs> Thanks for the question. Yeah. 
Uh, yeah, I have a question. Um, I feel like I talked to someone a long time ago who was somehow related to Lisa. I don't remember, but they mentioned something about using Lisa for exoplanet detection, and that seems crazy to me. Am I remembering that correctly? And if so, how could Lisa do that? <laughs> So Lisa is a big consortium. Uh, I'm not sure how many people are in it. Probably hundreds. Like goes over a thousand now. Um, so I'm not familiar with this research. Mm -hmm. But speculating, I could think microlensing might be a way. So I'm not sure, but um, it's possible that uh, microlensing by planets. Um, might provide some enhancement in a characteristic way of other signals, whether they be the galactic white dwarf background or supermassive black hole mergers. So that seems like a really worthwhile thing to study, but I'm not sure how viable it is at present. Okay, thanks. <laughs> yeah, that's super cool, Nora. Thanks for the idea. <laughs> I just want to clarify. So you're, you're talking about microlensing caused by exosolar planets. Yeah, so gravitational waves, as far as we know, should also experience microlensing in the same way that photons, well, no, electromagnetic waves do. And um, that is um, a topic of intense study by uh, the LIGO Scientific Collaboration, Virgo, and others right now. So I'm not aware of whether any has yet been detected, um, but if it isn't, if there's any discrepancy also in how microlensing behaves, that's very worthwhile. Currently, we have very tight constraints, I think, on the order of 10 to the minus 15, one part in um, uh, that is telling us that the speed of light and the speed of gravity seem to be the same. Um, and we can continue going down that road um, looking for any discrepancy, but there are several other areas where variations in general relativity might show up, um, possibly in microlensing behavior, possibly, and certainly if any polarizations are detected other than the ones, the two that we see so far, known as plus and cross, um, kind of like light has two polarizations, that would be extremely revealing also. So yeah, if there's any weird stuff in how gravity behaves, people really want to see it. And there's probably someone running a Bayesian analysis right now trying to find it. <laughs> it's just incredible to me that, I mean, what was it like four years ago we got the first gravitational wave detection? Five? I can't believe it, but so technically uh, we detected it on September 14th, 2015. Uh, I didn't know okay. until the next so, morning myself. And ago. yeah, and then it was announced on February 11th, 2016. Um, most people in the collaboration ha were pretty well convinced within the first couple of weeks. We ran a lot of studies to see if it had been a blind injection it wasn't uh, to see if somebody could have tampered with the system and you know you can never completely rule that out but we knew everybody who had the know-how and they they were pretty well accounted for so <laughs> I, I heard about all these like yeah. are we sure are we sure we're sure <laughs> yeah, exactly but it's like it's incredible to me that eight years ago we were talking about like the very first gravitational wave detection from like the most like massive objects that we can imagine or gravitationally right yeah in the universe and now we're talking about micro lensing from an excellent solar planet like maybe something yeah. like a couple times larger than the earth yeah. <laughs> it's incredible yeah gotta run the numbers but it's a it's so cool to think of yeah well uh, well very very cool um Valerie, go ahead. I do have one last question and it's hopefully pretty short and it's got nothing to do with gravitational waves, but Los Alamos is in the path of totality for the October eclipse. Yes. Are they gonna be doing anything fun? Cause I still need somewhere to go, so. <laughs> Uh, I still have my little eclipse viewer that I built for the partial solar eclipse of October 23rd, 2014, which is the day before my thesis defense. So I will be observing it myself from home. Um, yeah, I should check with our local nature center, the Pajarito Environmental Education Center, as well as Los Alamos itself to see if we're running any outreach. Um, possibly, we really should. That's a great idea.
I love Los Alamos. It's a really cool place. And I think more people should go there. So if they have an event, then we can tell people about it. <laughs> and, and speaking of eclipses, we are actually like exactly a year out and like three, a year, three days less than like the next great uh, eclipse, total solar eclipse that goes from Mexico to Canada. Um, I think it's uh, April 8th, right? Um, it is. Yeah. So, so we'll all meet Grant in October, and then you can all come to me in Cleveland in, in next April, because it's going to pass right overhead, assuming we can see it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm thinking maybe Saranac Lake. Uh, my uh, my mother-in-law lives there, so it might be fun, too. But anyways, yeah, we've got all kinds of uh, cool eclipses taking place. Um, I'm going to probably be in Jackson for the one in October. Uh, Let's see how it goes. My friends already booked their wedding for the day of the eclipse in the path of the eclipse. So we may be committed already. Nice. Nice. That's cool. Um, are these astronomers as well? Ah, uh, physics. Physics, at least. Okay. Cool. Cool. Well, we're, um, we're about out of time, but, but Grant, we always like to leave the last word to our special guest as well. So if you, if you have any words of advice, words of wisdom, or, um, or anything else that you'd like to leave everybody with and, and the folks at home as well it's um it's all yours oh goodness it is a journey embarking um in any career in astronomy or even just embracing the mysteries of the stars in your spare time i think um all you can do is keep trying to learn a little every day uh it is so challenging when it's cloudy out. <laughs> I had to keep persevering for months to get to see all the messiers in my backyard with my little Dobsonian. But but it happens if you keep plugging away at it. And I think that um, it just requires a bit of that hopefulness and um, opening yourself up to the possibilities of what happens. I did not expect that I would be here um, on this, you know, extinct super volcano uh, with my husband um, among the pines and the and the tarantulas and the ravens. But it is an amazing um, path, and I am just always looking forward to what the next day brings and the next night too with its stars. That's awesome. Nice addition there at the end. <laughs> uh, well, well, thank you for that, Grant. That was um, that was fantastic. Um, and thank you so much for being with us this evening. We really appreciate your time. And um, our operations director, Maggie, I'll reach out with a thank you gift for you. So yeah, thank you so much for your time. And um, yeah, um, best of luck with um, searching for gravitational waves. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. And thanks to um, all the co-hosts tonight. Yeah, thanks to uh, all the co-stars. As always, uh, we would uh, not have the show without you. So thanks so much for being here. Um, all the folks behind the scenes, uh, Maggie, our operations director, um, Latin Stargaze and Board of Directors, um, all of our donors, and of course, all of you at home uh, watching right now or watching this recording later on. Um, thanks for being with us. And we hope to see you again in a couple weeks. But until then, be well. And don't forget to look up. We'll see you next time. Bye. Bye. Thanks. <laughs>